And so, you know, I wonder if this is really going to be helpful to get more students invested in STEM when it's not necessarily being looked at in its full context. And what do I mean by that? Okay, so earlier this week, we had the White House Summit on STEM Equity and Excellence, and I wanted to revisit one particular point because there was this whole thing about the science of belonging and what have you. And I want to start first by replaying this particular portion from the White House Summit, which again, the YouTube video here will be linked in the... Um, in the description for you to this video so you can have a look at it. Um, but I wanted to play it over again, first off to address a couple of things that are in it um, related to this STEM summit, but also then to, <laughs> well, you'll see. So let me play this starting from here. I think it's about four or five minutes. Oh, there are so many commitments coming forward today as part of this initiative that are so exciting. At the Smithsonian, we're particularly excited to be uh, talking about our Smithsonian Science Education Center, which has a partnership with the Defense Department, focusing on uh, grades three through five technology education around nine, mil uh, nine military bases, the rural communities around them. Our initiatives that we're working on to upskill teachers, we just heard Alondra talking about that the work that's being done anyway. around teachers, which is so critical. And then two major initiatives of the secretaries around our shared future, reckoning with our racial past and our shared future Good. life on a sustainable planet, where we're really thinking about how we bring in education, STEM education initiatives into that. So this idea of promising practices, which we'd like to focus on today, and I'm going to start with Joaquin Tamayo, who's the chief of staff um, to the deputy secretary of the Department of Education. And obviously, you're doing so much focused on STEM, really so thinking this about this issue of how we reach kids all on. around the country with the initiatives. And can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for, can you hear me? We're okay. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for having me here. And, and the Deputy Secretary sends her regrets. She was at the Orion Splashdown event in San Diego Secretary. yesterday, uh, welcoming back um, the uh, un, uh, person craft secretary. with 800 young people and families in San Diego advice. celebrating that historic milestone. Um, so she sends her apologies. She wasn't able to make it back in time for this event. So I'm happy to represent her and the department here. Um, what a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, my co-panelists, uh, for being here as well. Um, what we did at the department starting last year um, was to under the secretary uh, charged the deputy secretary to really understand from the ground up what was happening in our STEM classrooms, in our STEM spaces, what were the issues that the department could most productively address. So we took our time, we took about a year to really dive deep with the field, hundreds of conversations, engagements with field leaders, states, school districts and schools all across the country and young people themselves to really understand what were some students. catalytic moves that the department could make um, you know, pretty quickly, as quickly as possible so that we could see um, or we can move closer to STEM equity and excellence for all students. And what we heard loud and clear from all across the country. I want to make a point here real quick. You, I'm seeing this a lot more where they're trying to pair equity and excellence together. Still have a serious question of whether or not equity actually leads to excellence, which my guess is it probably doesn't. But anyway. Tree is that we really have, we're experiencing right now, particularly as we come out of the pandemic, a crisis of belonging in this country, a crisis of belonging in our classrooms, a crisis of belonging oh, among our educators, um, and it's having a real uh, serious impact. Um, and so as we, we dug deep, and again, to understand the role that the Department of Education could most productively play, um, we, we centered on, you know, we could really make um, some headway by addressing what it takes to ensure that all of our students from pre-K all the way through higher education can experience and benefit from, not just access. I think we, we talk a lot about access, but not enough about the benefit of that access. Um, benefit from rigorous, relevant, and joyful STEM learning. So rigorous, yes. Relevant, what do you mean? Relevant to the student's current situation? Joyful? No offense, I've never, I've never necessarily, joyful comes with a natural curiosity kind of thing there. And, you know, 
I don't know that every everybody has the same levels of curiosity when it comes to STEM, which is a thing of why you may not belong because you don't find STEM related problems to be interesting. So why push the belonging in there? Anyway, if the if the, <laughs> the young people told us themselves, if if what we're learning is not something that inspires us, that gets us up in the morning, even with the challenges. It's not about making learning easy. It's about making learning worth it. So you got to offer some kind of reward. It has to inspire me. It has to make me feel good. Hold it. The pursuit of the truth is what science is about, what a lot of STEM disciplines is about. And yeah, I can understand, you know, wanting to have kids motivated and keep and keep the, um, keep the, uh, curiosity going so that they they go invested in that and want to learn yes there's a certain amount there i'm not discounting that at the same time what if the truth that you find when you do research isn't something that inspires you it's something that's ugly it's something that's revolting or it's something that's depressing or perhaps depressing to you depending upon your worldview Does that mean it's not worth learning it? See, equating, equating feeling good with learning about something is very antithetical to what science is. Science is about the pursuit of the truth. And so this, this approach of making everybody feel good about what they're learning, that it's got to inspire them. Well, what if it doesn't? That doesn't make it any less worthwhile to learn. And what you're talking about is you have to communicate it that way. It has to feel good. Well, no, there's a big difference between feeling good and is good, or in this case, is something true. Every single day that I show up to a classroom, I have to like it. It has to be joyful at the end of the day. Um, and so uh, really leaning into rigorous, relevant, and joyful education. When it came to... Did anybody think... Wait, did they think in the Department of Ed that maybe you... Maybe if it's not joyful to the kid it's just not something they want to go into still need to learn the basics about a lot of these things yes but maybe it's just something the kid doesn't want to go into ultimately for a career the teachers stem teachers you know really um felt like like you know they were um well let me put it this way about uh I just want to zoom ahead a little bit here because the actual point is trying to learning. And so through all of that, um, we were so happy um, to develop a new initiative that we just launched last week. So this is very, very timely. Um, last Wednesday at the department, the, the largest in-person gathering at the department since at least March of 2020, um, the first time the department has launched a major STEM initiative in well over a decade. Um, and it's called, very simply, You Belong in STEM. And we're sending an unequivocal message to, to say thank you very much. Everybody does. And that just might be because they you don't like it. Unequivocal message to our students and to our educators, that no matter who or where you are, you belong in STEM. And we're leaning into the science of belonging. And so I hope, you know, after this, uh, after this uh, seminar or this summit, if you don't know much about the science of belonging, Google it, learn about the science of belonging. When young people and teachers, anybody, um, are, are enveloped in learning within environments that, that provide a sense of safety and belonging, the brain works better. They, people can devote their full brain power to the challenging coursework, the challenging work that STEM uh, entails. Um, so it's not just something that we're saying to be nice to people or because it sounds nice. The science of belonging, when we can ha help people feel like they belong in all the spaces where they're tackling really hard subjects, really hard concepts, challenging themselves, when they feel like they belong, cortisol is lowered, oxytocin is increased, and we can apply for the full brain power of our students to the work at hand. So we're really, really excited. We just kicked off. First off, they're not yours. They're not, the brain power of the students is not yours. <laughs> the way that phrasing came off was just weird. So what they're talking about is the science of belonging, right? Um, and so I did, actually. I took a hot, a hot minute earlier today, um, or yesterday, if you're watching the recording, and got into, this came up, and it ended up being actually quite a nice uh, little summary from the psychology side of what might be referred to as the science of belonging, or the science behind our need to belong, insights into the history, present, and future of belonging research. Uh, this is from earlier this year in Psychology Today. 
So most of the earlier findings around belonging haven't changed. People need to feel a sense of belonging. Problem with this is that you, <laughs> they, they have a hard time defining it, as you'll find out. Belonging researchers, that just sounds weird, need greater agreement on terminology, measures, and definitions to create clarity for practice. Okay, so here's the thing. This is 2022. They're doing this whole initiative at the Department of Education to try and get students in STEM under this notion of belonging. But there's no agreement. Well, not no agreement. There's not very much agreement on terminology, measures, and definitions for the clarity of the practice of it. So how the hell are you going to even know you're successful? My question there. A new generation of belonging researchers should be encouraged to envision their work as having a far-reaching impact. Mm, maybe. But more, more importantly, if you're doing research, I mean, you should be encouraged that you're getting at the truth about something. Anyway, like, why do you feel that need to belong? This contribution draws from a recent paper, the need to belong, desire for interpersonal attachments as a fundamental human motivation, during Kelly, uh, by Kelly, et al., Kelly Ann et al. During a wide-ranging interview, uh, Baumeister, Baumeister excuse me, and Leary provide insights into the history, present, and future of belonging research. Belonging has been a hard construct for researchers to define and conceptualize because its meaning is often drawn from what predicts it or what outcomes emerge from experiencing it. It is well known that being part of something and feeling like you belong somewhere, such as in a group, feels good to most people. And while research on belonging took place before 1995, it didn't go much further than this. So in other words, you haven't done much with that in 1995, until 1995. Okay. However, in 1995, Baumeister and Leary's landmark paper, The Need to Belong, Desire for Interpersonal Attachments as a Fundamental Human Motivation, firmly identified belonging as a universal human need, ingrained in our motivation as a species and stemming deeply from our ancestral roots. The paper resulted in a significant change in our understanding of belonging, especially as it relates to our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Loneliness, caring for an older population, and school violence are just some of the problems people face today. Research on belonging has played an important role in responding to these problems and, offering great rel and offers great relevance to educational psychology. Belonging significantly impacts students' well-being, achievement behavior, and mental health. Making it critically important, making it a critically important topic for study. Okay, so I'm <laughs> I'm noting that in all of this, I still haven't gotten um, a construct and definition and conceptualization of what is meant by that. But I don't think I don't think the premise is necessarily wrong. We're humans are generally speaking a very social species, so yeah, I can understand that there is a desire to be have interpersonal connections and relationships with people that are, that are good and prosperous or to participate in, in a societal interaction or what have you. Um, I don't disagree that those things exist. Um, awkward jump, by the way. Um, so let us continue. Uh, researchers can use the need to belong to build human motivation and action theories. The human mind has a primary and almost universal desire to form and keep relationships with others. The need to belong may well be considered important, as has been discussed alongside other human needs in, in the history of psychological research, food and water, sex, aggression, etc., courtesy of Glaser, Maslow, and Freud. Um, Mark Leary's identification of self-esteem as a key factor in people's quest for belonging was a second important historical event in belonging research. Self-esteem can be an internal measure of how well someone fits in with others and how appealing they might be to other people. Can be is the key word there, because I don't often think of self-esteem just as that, as much as your confidence, um, your confidence in yourself. And this is not to be confused with arrogance, which is <laughs> confidence undeserved, effectively. Um, but, interesting... As a research construct, self-esteem has been battered by criticism over recent, over recent years and considered as just a sense of personal value or worth. That's what I was going to say, because that, that actually makes more sense to me when I'm thinking about self-esteem. Uh, this, this view raises raised concerns that a focus on self-esteem breeds self-interest and individualism. You say that like it's a bad thing. Individualism itself is not a bad thing. It's when you go oh, so selfishness that you don't give a damn about anybody else. That is a problem. But, 
But um, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Being an individual and looking out for individual self and having your own thoughts and unique ideas and what have you and having a certain amount of self-interest, which actually everybody does have. Um, yeah. However, for many educational researchers, self-esteem has an important place in school outcomes and student success. As it relates to belonging research, the constructs of self-esteem and belonging are richly intertwined. And the well-documented advance, advances in these two constructs spurred on by Leary's work ensure that they will remain important and relevant for many years to come. Most of the earlier findings around belonging have not changed. Okay. People need to feel a sense of belonging. Belonging and sense of belonging. Can you... I got a problem with multiple definitions or things like this, and it's just like, okay, what's belonging? What's a sense of belonging? And if you're going to say a sense of belonging is a sense of feeling like you belong, spare me the circular frickin' definitions. In fact, Baumeister suggested that a sense of belonging may be even more important than having an intimate relationship. Wouldn't you belong if you have an intimate relationship? You belong in that said relationship? Anyway. Uh, one area of belonging research calling for more attention, according to Baumeister and Leary, involves how the need for belonging differs greatly among people. People's personal level of need to belong can remarkably shape how motivated people are to join groups, catch up with friends and family, or engage in the school or workplace. Now, going back to this in sort of participation in STEM, if you don't feel like you want to go into a STEM career, if STEM doesn't inspire you, if you're not inspired by those lessons in STEM, no matter how well they're taught, then yeah, you're not going to feel like you belong in STEM. That's not the fault of any sort of barriers or anything like that. People, there's, there's, I, the tendency that I noticed in the White House Summit was that this whole thing of belonging is very much seems is very much seems, wow, I can't talk today, um, seems very much like the presumption is people don't feel like they belong because of all of these systemic barriers, which is, again, the single cause fallacy laid out there. But no, it could be that I just don't like STEM. I can't force a student to like being in STEM. Even if they're very good at it, you can hate being in a STEM career. You could also be very terrible at it and love being in a STEM career. Same thing. You could be very inspired. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that's because of the, any barriers that were placed in your way or any inequitable teaching, if you will. Um, so anyway, Baumeister and Leary also stress the importance of defining terms. For belonging researchers, this means thinking carefully about what belonging means for their research. Does it mean feeling part of a group or something else? Their 1995 article was merely about dyadic relationship, dyadic, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, relationships. But if written today, Baumeister and Leary stated that the definition of belonging would be much broader. They use the word to belong, which can imply being part of something. Circular frickin' definitions. Yeah, definitions do matter, but stop being circular with them. Um, but though you may not necessarily feel like you belong to your neighbor... I'm not my neighbor's property, so that that doesn't even make a damn lick of sense to begin with. You might <laughs> you might feel instead like you fit in. While Baumeister and Leary were unable to recall why they chose the word belong, the more clunky need to be accepted and belong may be clearer, as is, quote, the desire for social connections with both people and people in a group. Belonging researchers also need greater agreement on terminology measures and definitions to create greater clarity around the implications of their findings for schools. They also need to improve how they communicate their findings to a broader audience. So one thing I want to say is if you're, go if you're getting into some of the research, and particularly with the social-emotional learning stuff, because that's where this fits in too, is this whole stuff on belonging comes in the social-emotional learning stuff that might be taught in schools. Um, you need to make sure you have a good understanding. What does somebody mean by belonging? And ask them to be specific. And if they use the word belong in their definition, roast them for using circular definitions. Because that's like not a very specific definition at all. It tells you nothing um, about what it means to belong. Uh, <clears throat> you could also go back to the dictionary definition. But anyway, if we're talking about the psychology side of it, make sure there's these kinds of things. And again, when it comes to STEM... 
you may not belong, but that's not necessarily because of any of the barriers. Remember this STEM equity and excellence workshop was about removing supposed structural barriers and things like that to help more students get into STEM careers. So yeah, what if you remove all of that, but students don't necessarily like STEM anyway? You can make it the most engaging lesson ever, but if students don't find it interesting, and how, how can you account for all the likes and dislikes of all students? How can you account for that? Seriously, seriously. How many different ways would you have to craft a lesson to get every single student to be inspired by something? How, how do, you, do you even think that's possible in public and private school environments where you get, you know, classes of however many? Um, I kind of don't, to be honest. I would defer to others who are a little bit more expertise in the education side of things than me, but I don't think so. So that just makes it impractical to begin with. But um, not to say it's not necessary. I mean, we do need to do better with education in STEM as shown by the, you know, nation's report card scores, which woo, <laughs> something like 22% of high school seniors are proficient in science. Last I checked. Oy. <clears throat> Even though belonging in educational systems has received considerable attention from researchers, studies have failed to investigate the developmental implications of belonging and how the quest for belonging differs across developmental and school stages. While research on high school students dominate the literature, there are very many differences between school belonging research in university versus secondary school versus elementary primary school, and the differences and these differences can be dependent on which discipline is doing the investigating, which is to say like behavioral psychology or psychology or any of the number of different psychological or socio sociological disciplines. Anyway, scholars have much work to bridge these educational contexts and transdisciplinary understandings to belong. While acknowledging the importance of belonging as a basic human, still haven't gotten an exact definition anyway, um, it is hoped that this reflective account clarifies some of the underlying assumptions about belonging, I don't know that it does, encourages the next generation of belonging researchers to envision their work as having far-reaching impact. Not necessarily. Um, well, no, I could see it. I could see it if you're talking about school stuff, but anyway. Opens up new ways of thinking about educational psychology's role in developing policies and practices centered on belonging. Still no definition of what that is. Um, so as it comes to STEM, um, with this, First off, let's figure out, you know, what do you mean by belong? What do you mean by belonging? And you're also talking about students, young students for the most part, um, which they admitted here, they have done nothing. Um, there's very little in there about what belonging means at the developmental stages. Um, at least according to this, I could be wrong if it exists elsewhere, um, for students in elementary school, uh, university, and primary, uh, elementary school, primary school, middle school, um, and universities are different from high school for sure. Um, in that sense, you may have actually developed a sense of self-esteem that you don't necessarily need to feel like you're part of a huge number of groups if that's how you define belonging. Um... The, the other thing with this is that I, I always get leery when you're talking about research like this because you're involving kids, little kids, and trying to figure out these things and potentially messing with them in, in ways that you're not necessarily going to see the outcomes of that until they're much older. Um, so this is where it gets, of course, very leery for me. But at the same time, uh, this kind of stuff feeds into the social emotional learning things that are being done in schools right now. Um, it's not an illegitimate question to look at that aspect of human life where we, we do want to have connections with others. We do want to feel, you know, like we do want to have interpersonal relationships and good relationships with others. We're a social species, if you think about it that way. Um... we are very much a social species that way. And I think that is a good question to look at. 
I always get concerned when there's this where when there's ideology involved that comes from the critical social justice and postmodern worldview perspective, because I wonder if that really is about belonging, or if that's just about shoving people out, ripping things apart. It's hard to tell. And I don't necessarily know. And I wouldn't invite, you know, your own thoughts on that when you think of some of the postmodernist garbage that's unfortunately in psychology. And there's there's actually a whole lot of news going on about that. If you followed Lee Jusum um, lately, you would you would notice um, <laughs> you would notice that he's got notes from from a quite an interesting thing that's unsafe, unsafe science on Substack. If you're interested, um, but there is things like that that I get concerned about. And that feeds into the cur curious concern of letting ideology bias all of science in one particular direction or another. And so, you know, I wonder if this is really going to be helpful to get more students invested in STEM when it's not necessarily being looked at in its full context. And what do I mean by that? With the STEM summit um, that the White House held the other day, what was plain to me was that it seemed to be more so about systemic barriers and getting rid of this thing and all this other kind of stuff, very much from postmodern ascent, having watched it over again. Um, but that ignores... That, that presents its own kind of single cause fallacy. It, it, and no, actually, it is a single cause fallacy now that I think about it. If you're presuming that a student doesn't feel like they belong for whatever reason, because of some sort of barrier that's been placed in their way, um, systemic or otherwise, you know, so you, I don't feel like I belong because systemic racism, something like that. Or that student doesn't feel like they belong because systemic racism. That's a single cause. There may actually be more than one reason why a student doesn't feel like they belong. And one of them could just quite simply be, and I've hammered it a few times, which I often do. I often repeat myself because I'm thinking through these things as I'm reading. Um, that student may feel like they don't belong quite simply because they just don't like STEM and they don't want to go into that as a career. Um, particularly as you're getting into the older high school you know, high school and university student things. It's like, it's like I've, I've known students who wanted to go into meteorology as an example and said to me, you know, Hey, I, I just, I, I said to me at one point when I was, um, walking through, it's like, yeah, no, it, does, does meteorology have a lot of math in it? I really don't like math. I'm not going to be a meteorologist. There is a lot of math in meteorology. Um, and that's not an ill thing. You don't have to belong in every discipline. You don't have to belong in every field. And indeed, why would you, if you don't like that field, why would you feel like you belong in a room full of scientists who are talking very technical details? Does that mean you should not have some understanding of science? Does that mean you should not be uh, able to... D does that mean you should not have access to scientific knowledge and anything like that? You should not make it available to you? No, of course not. It does not mean that. But we should not push somebody to try and make them belong if they don't feel like they belong simply because they don't enjoy that particular topic. That's not actually a way to help get more people into STEM. Anyway, my random thoughts on the whole science of belonging as it applies to STEM education. Let me know what you think. Hit the like button on the way out the door, comment on the video, share the video, subscribe to the channel, all that lovely good jazz, and I will see you next time. And until next time, I'm Adrian. May you stay curious.